Thank you for tuning in today. We're going to talk about Death in the Compass, which is a wonderful Borges attempt at a um, detective novel, but it's not just any detective novel. It's an intellectual detective novel. We meet um, the um, detective Lonrot, and uh, we know that according to our text, as I quote from the first paragraph, um, the criminal we have heard about, Red Sherlock, who becomes very important, and we know that the criminal had sworn on his honor to kill Lonra. And um, to swear on his honor is kind of interesting because he's a very ordinary criminal involved in murder and burglary and such. And the concept that that kind of a criminal would have honor already sets us up for the idea that this is not just any vengeance murder. It's an honor vengeance. Okay, so we know that um, Lonrat thought of himself as a pure thinker, but there was something of the adventure in, of him and even of the gamester. So that um, we see he's very philosophical. And when confronted with a murder, when called in with a murder of um, Dr. Marcel Yarmolinsky, he refuses the simple interpretation of the murder. His um, co-worker has suggested that on page two, I'll read the paragraph, there's no need to look for a chimera or a cat with three legs, Tevrianus was saying as he brandished an imperious cigar. We know that the Tetriarch of Galilee is the possessor of the finest sapphires in the world. Someone intending to steal them came in here by mistake. Yarmosky got up, the robber had to kill him. What do you think? Now, in the end, we learned that's exactly what happened. But um, that would not be interesting. And so we continue to read on the second page. It's possible, but not interesting, Lonrat answered. You will reply that reality has the slightest need to be of interest. And I'll answer you that reality may avoid the obligation to be interesting. Um, but that hypotheses may not. In the hypotheses you have postulated, chance intervenes largely. Here lies a dead rabbi. I should prefer a purely rabbinical explanation, not an imaginary mischance of an imaginary robber. So, um, so he then begins to study the books and the works of the rabbi who has died, and they find... Um, that the rabbi has typed in his machine, uh, his typewriter, that the first letter of the name has been spoken. So it becomes a rabbinical mystery, and he starts to study the ancient texts of this Talmudic Jewish sect. And um, he becomes fascinated by the idea that God has a secret name. And starts to read about these, and this information is published. We know later on that his murderer has read that he's reading these, begins to read them too, and become because of this we have this great cat and mouse um, pursuit and eventual murder. Um, so it emerges, he discovers that different people have been killed at um, different points in the city and that in fact there's almost a mathematical um, relationship between the places where all the murders have murders have happened, and that um, Lundrod is able, um, after having received information that the murders occurred in a triangle, he dismisses this notion. And he's able to infer that there will be a fourth murder um, in a fourth spot, and that it's really a, um, a rectangle, not a perfect triangle or a square. So there's a mathematical solution. And in some ways, the um, murderer has played him as if it were a chess game. He's used bait. So if anybody plays chess, you might see that he's entrapped him. He's put pieces out to be captured merely to lure Lenrot to risk his own life. So, um, this occurs at the time of Carnival, and Carnival in Argentina is not quite the same as Carnival in Brazil. Some of you are reading Doña Flora, Doña Flora, and you realize that Carnival is kind of a raucous, sensuous, wild thing. 
and it's more like a middle age um uh, middle ages um ritual in Argentina that we have people dressed up as jousters. We have um, the man who's driving the car in the second murder uh, wearing a bear mask. So that, again, there's this kind of fantastical um, gloss. And, and Borges really was a, a master of the fantastical. And we see that it's a very economical story, that every word has a meaning and a place in the story. And in the course of not very many pages, he manages to weave a fairly complex plot in a complex scene. So um, so that in each murder site it says the name, the second name or the third name of God has been spoken and so he's convinced this is really a bit rabbinical or a Hasidic or a Talmudic mystery and that we have the play on numbers because we discover that uh, a day goes from sunrise to sundown according to the Jewish calendar and that these murders occur after sundown so they really occur on the fourth day and all the clues point to a fourth murder. So Lenrot figures this out and he decides to go out early and um, to you know be witness and catch the murderers and solve the crime and um, he goes out to Triste Le Roy which is actually French for the sad king. And we discover eventually in the story that this is the place where his nemesis was wounded and suffered after Lenormand killed his brother, and that it's kind of a house of horrors with dual staircases and echoing chambers and endless windows looking at the same courtyard. It's kind of a house of mirrors, a house of horrors. And we know that... Borges had a fascination with mirrors and with um, symmetry and with um, things that echo each other. So Lindrock goes there, or he figures out the house, and he goes to a window, and sure enough, he discovers that Red Sarlacc is there to kill him. But it's not just an ordinary murder, because, you know, if you think about it, a vengeance murder, Red Sarlacc, who has every reason to be angry. His brother was killed. He was wounded. He suffered greatly. Could have just gone to um, Lynn Rott's house and shot him dead, but instead he sets up this very complicated scheme. And so it seems like he is determined to best Lynn Rott at his own game, which is an intellectual and theological game, not just a simple game of um, hunting and murdering or um, detective work. And so that he is, to, this is where the honor comes in. He's determined to humiliate Lindrat by solving the problem, by killing him, by setting up this complicated game, and by entrapping him. But Lindrat's response at the end of the um, short story is not to be humiliated, but to say, next time you make a labyrinth. And again, we have the return to this idea of labyrinth, and that's a major theme in all of Borges' works. Um, we have this idea of the labyrinth, and um, he said next time you'll set up a labyrinth of one line, and um, the idea is that there's going to be a reincarnation, and that these two will be constantly battling to the death, and that um, Lenrock will always lose, and that he'll be, in the next life, they'll set up a labyrinth of one line, so they're already planning out the next life, so it's, um, it's a Buddhist. It's definitely based on reincarnation and Buddhist thought. And it's um, more than just an intellect, more than just a work, a detective novel. It really is kind of a mystical, hermeneutic detective novel based on solving a puzzle. So many of Borges' stories are puzzles that need to be solved, chess games, if you will. Very intellectual. So if you were to write an an analysis of this short story, you'd want to refer to specific lines in the text as I did and show how the beginning foreshadows the end in many respects and how some of the symbols that reoccur in this short story are reoccurrent of Borges. Thank you.